Hello and welcome everyone today to the third webinar in our series, Exploring the Senses. My name is Bethany Bruin and I am an occupational therapist by background and part of our subject matter expert team here at Autism Ontario. Today's session is titled Sensory Tools and Strategies for Children. Uh, and just a reminder, if you weren't able to attend our first two uh, webinars in this series, they are available in the resources section. So feel free to click through there um, to find more information about how to access those other webinars. So to start today's session, here is a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, first of all, we will review some of the concepts from our last webinars. Um, so these are related to sensory processing and sensory integration. We'll talk about some strategies related to each of the sensory systems, and then finally we'll complete a sensory scavenger hunt together. Uh, so once again, we have a lot of content to cover today, and I want to make sure that we have time for any questions at the end. So please feel free to enter your questions using the Q&A function at any time during the webinar. I'll try to get to as many participants as I can during our live Q&A portion, and I'm also able to answer the questions in the chat as we go. So let's get started with our review. In our previous webinars, we discussed the process of sensory integration, where we take input from the outside world, we process, organize, and in interpret sorry, this information in our brain, and then we respond with an action or an output. So this is sometimes also referred to as sensory processing. And we then talked about what it looks like when someone has difficulty with sensory processing. So some people might be over-responsive to certain sensory stimulation and other people are under-responsive. So under-responsive means they have a big cup and they need a lot of input to fill their cup or they have what we call a high threshold. Over-responsive means they have a small cup so their cup can easily overflow with too much input and they have what we call a low threshold. So then we discussed four different categories or sensory styles and reviewed strategies related to each style. And today we'll be focusing on strategies for all children and for adults as well. We'll discuss these strategies as they relate to each of the sensory systems. So you may recall we had our common senses, smell, taste, touch, hearing, and sight, as well as we had important senses related to movement and body position. So our proprioception, which is related to body position and muscle control, and our vestibular sense, which is related to movement and balance in relation to gravity or head position. Finally, we had our internal sense of interoception that helps us to understand our body processes. So our heart rate, breathing, and hunger. And just a reminder, um, feel free to enter questions in the Q&A function as we go through. So first of all, in terms of strategies, we are going to talk about the sense of smell or our olfactory sense. Our olfactory sense is connected to our limbic system, which is the center for emotion and memory. So that's why sometimes certain smells can trigger those strong memories and emotional responses. If we keep in mind that we might be either over responsive or under responsive to certain smells, then strategies for this sense might include for those who are over responsive or have that low threshold or small cup, uh, we want to avoid those strong scents or perfumes. So often there's a no scent policy um, if you're in a workplace or at a school, but this rule doesn't always apply when we're out and about in the community. So it's important to be aware of the different smells and different environments, uh, for example, in stores or restaurants and even outside. So one example is um, my daughter, she can't stand the store, the bulk barn. I don't know if you've ever been. Um, the store has a wide variety of food products and they're all available in bulk. And many of these food products have strong scents. So there's spices, there's candy, and kind of that mix and combination of all of those smells together can be somewhat overwhelming. So it can be helpful to be kind of playful when we're exploring our senses. We wanna to talk to your child about how things smell and discuss which smells they like and they don't like. And often it's enough just to be paying attention to these different smells and coming up with a plan ahead of time if a smell is going to impact an activity. So for example, if you're going on a shopping trip to the mall and there's a store like Bath and Body Works that's gonna have some strong scents coming out of it, you wanna plan your route so that maybe you're taking a different, um, different walking route through the mall so you're avoiding that section. Um, our next strategy is around allowing for the windows to be open for fresh air when possible. So if you have access to that fresh air, sometimes it's amazing how much of an impact something seemingly small like opening a window can have. And then for those who are under responsive or have that higher threshold and need a lot of scent input to fill their cup, 
we can experiment with aromatherapy if tolerated. So things like essential oils, um, where we have calming or alerting smells. And I know there's a lot of people that swear by those certain scents or es essential oils. It might take some playing around with to find combinations that work best for you and for your child. Again, it's amazing how much of an impact something like this can have. So moving on to our next sense, our sense of taste or our gustatory sense. So we all have preferences for certain foods or tastes that we love and some that we don't stand. Oh, sorry, can't stand. So for example, if you've ever tried the herb cilantro, um, you might enjoy it and find it quite refreshing and flavorful. And I know there's also some people that the flavor of cilantro tastes kind of like soap. So if we keep this in mind, we want to allow our children to experiment with different tastes and then still give them permission to dislike certain flavors or foods. And I know sensory issues as they relate to feeding or picky eating are extremely common, particularly in the autistic population. So we don't have time to get too much into detail, detail about that today, um, but we're gonna talk about some general strategies. So the first is just allowing children to be exposed to a variety of tastes, temperatures, and textures of food without necessarily the expectation that they must eat anything. We can also be aware of strong tastes and smells that might cause distress in sensitive children or individuals. So for example, spicy foods. On our next slide here, we talk about um, gustatory and tactile strategy. So we wanna keep in mind that picky eating or what we think might be preferences related to taste might actually be related to some other sensory properties such as texture or smell. So incorporating food and encouraging touching and tasting of food at other times during the day, so not just at meal times, is another great way to encourage that gustatory or taste exploration. So we can allow for food play to explore the physical properties of food um, during mealtime, as we mentioned, but as well as incorporating those food items into maybe craft time or play time to provide those opportunities for exposure without necessarily the pressure to eat. So some examples of food play might include using fruit or vegetables to make art. Um, so thinking about the idea of using, say, a celery stalk as a paintbrush or making a stamp out of an apple or a potato. You can also add real or pretend food items to a sensory bin. So thinking about using dried pasta or rice or beans or cereal as a base and then adding either plastic or real fruits or vegetables to play with. Um, you can also use clean food containers to sort and play with food. Older children, youth, and teens might enjoy being part of food preparation. They can look at food items online to help with grocery, grocery shopping. They can choose a recipe they want to try or help to select the ingredients. And younger children can help with measuring or stirring baking ingredients, while older children might help with chopping vegetables, for example. You can set up taste tests during food preparation or try different versions of similar foods. Um, so one example in our family, we tried a carrot taste test. So we had baby carrots, um, we peeled some regular carrots, we had cooked carrots, um, we bought those matchstick style carrots um, and had a sort of a taste test of which one we preferred when in reality, it was just an effort to have the kids try to eat more carrots. Um, you can make silly smoothies or soups by adding different ingredients with preferred and non-preferred food items. And smoothies and soups are also a great way to get around some of those texture issues uh, that might be a challenge for some. So in general, we wanna keep the emphasis on fun and exploration rather than pressure to eat or worried about food intake or food waste. So next we're going to talk about touch and tactile strategies. So again, remembering that that over-responsive or under responsive piece. So some people have a small cup and might be really sensitive to even the smallest touch. So we think about our kids that are sensitive to tags and clothing. And then some people might need a lot of touch input. So these are our kiddos who are constantly pulling toys off the shelf, putting things in their mouth um, and have their hands all over us. So for those under responsive folks who need a lot of input, fortunately there is an abundance of sensory tools for those busy folks who need to be touching things to stay regulated. Um, on this slide, there's a few examples of fidget tools that are available at stores like School Specialty online. Um, your child might be familiar with fidget tools through working with an OT, or they might have access to these tools at school. And essentially the idea is that we're providing lots of input to those busy hands to try and fill their cup in an appropriate or an acceptable way. 
So it's important to note that we set an expectation that fidgets are used as a tool, which is providing organizing touch that helps the child to feel regulated. And if the tool becomes a distraction rather than a tool, then its use needs to be limited. There are all kinds of fidget tools that are available, and many are available widely at toy stores. So I know you can get some of them at Toys R Us or Mastermind, um, Showcase, Walmart, and your child might wanna try a few different types to see what works best for them. There's also oral fidgets or chewies that provide that touch input to the lips, tongue, and teeth in more that appropriate or acceptable way. Uh, you could use a water bottle with a straw as well, and that's a way to provide that oral touch input and is a great one for older kids or teens and youth. Um, so on our next slide, we have some examples of uh, strategies for those who are more sensitive to touch input. So those who have a small cup that can easily overflow. So we want to provide opportunities to explore those new or novel tactile or texture experiences in a gradual controlled way that helps the child feel safe and feel like they're in control. Um, so some examples might include having, again, sort of a sensory table or a sand or water table where they can play with different textures. We can use Play-Doh or Play Foam. Uh, slime has been a big one the last few years. Uh, food prep, as we discussed previously. And we also want to consider offering tactile experiences, um, not just for the hands, but ones that involve the whole body. Uh, one strategy your OT may be familiar with is brushing using deep pressure. Um, so again, that would be in consultation with your OT. Uh, and pictured here, we have a sensory obstacle course. So this is an activity that was set up by my friends at Providence Children's Center in Calgary, Alberta. Um, and it included using shredded paper and clay, colored rice and Orbeez, and then there was an opportunity to rinse off in a small uh, little kiddie pool. So the idea was that the child could step from one bin to the next bin at their own pace. Um, so that might be a little more involved than something that you want to try at home. Uh, but you could modify that activity to use just one small bin and try one different texture item um, each day or each week, depending on your child's interest and how they tolerate that activity. Uh, so moving on to the next slide for our auditory sense or a sense of hearing. And again, keeping in mind our over-responsive and under-responsive reactions. So we want to be thinking about how sounds in our environment can impact us in different ways. Our first pointer here is just about being aware of sounds and noise in each environment. So similar to how we discussed that um, being aware of different scents for our olfactory scents. So if you're indoors, think about how sound travels. So for example, in a large building, such as a grocery store or a shopping mall, or especially in an indoor gym or a pool setting, there might be lots of echoing, which can be really distracting or dysregulating. At our last webinar, we talked about that idea of echoing in the washroom too, um, with those automatic flush toilets. So remember, we discussed the concept of habituation or getting used to certain sounds over time or certain uh, sensations over time, and how in some cases that habituation response is disrupted. So that might mean if you go to a hockey arena, initially it might feel really loud and echoey and uncomfortable, but after a few minutes, you're able to start to tune out that sound to a point where it's tolerable. If your child, on the other hand, has challenges with that habituation response, they may never get to a point where the sound in a hockey arena is tolerable. And this is where noise canceling headphones can be really helpful, or even just using regular headphones or earphones that cover the ears so that it dampens the, the sound enough to make it more comfortable or tolerable. And the nice thing is that headphones are so commonplace these days, um, especially for older children, teens and youth, it's totally an appropriate and easy to use um, strategy, having those headphones that you can wear pretty much anywhere. Um, being aware of background noise at home. So some people maybe have a TV on in the background or a radio or music playing. Um, and we want to also be able to recognize those sensory seekers who love to make noise for noise's sake. So these are the children who are constantly humming, singing, talking, um, maybe just playing with their voice. So they're babbling or shrieking or giggling or grunting. And while it's not always sort of to speak, so to speak, appropriate um, to be making noise in certain environments. So I'm thinking about that sort of cliche of having the librarian shushing people um, or telling them to be quiet. Um, we can find environments where it is appropriate to make noise. Um, so that's another reason why I really encourage families to spend time outside 
um, playing at a playground or running in a field is totally uh, appropriate and great opportunity to make a lot of noise. So that leads nicely into our next few points about experimenting with sound. So experimenting with sound can look like maybe learning to play different instruments. So if your child is motivated by numbers and patterns, um, music can be a great way to tap into this strength. It can also be very regulating. So I know a few kiddos who really enjoyed and excelled at math, and then they were able to use this strength to learn to play the drums. If you don't have access to proper musical instruments, you can totally improvise with items around the house. So you can probably picture you know, a toddler banging on pots and pans, um, and this can work as well for older children. So I know there's several therapeutic drumming programs that involve using a therapy ball as a drum or even turning over a bucket. Um, you can take a large pool noodle and cut it in half to use makeshift and safe uh, drumsticks. So kind of being creative with how you're using materials and experimenting with sound, of course, and don't forget singing. Um, if we talk about using, using music mindfully, we mean paying attention to those calming or alerting properties that music might have on us. So you can try out all different genres of music and have your child reflect on how it makes them feel. You can use music as a guide for creating other forms of art. So maybe have your child move their body in different ways or draw or paint to represent how the music makes them feel. You can be mindful of the volume of music and when you're using it. Uh, so, for example, I had a sweet little girl on my caseload a few years ago um, who always arrived to our sessions very dysregulated. She would sing to herself, but she was often repeating the same words over and over again and appeared very agitated. We started adding music to our sessions, playing some of her favorite children's songs while she calmed down in the swing for a few minutes. And then we started using those songs as a way to structure our play. So one example was Old MacDonald Had a Farm um, was one of her favorite songs. So we started incorporating farm themed toys and activities into our play. We use music there as a calming tool as well as a learning tool. Uh, and finally, as much as possible, trying to have a quiet, calm down space available to take a break if needed. So you can plan your outings or events to have an escape plan or just a break time if needed. So that might mean escaping to the car for a quiet five minutes to chill out after a busy trip to the grocery store. Um, or you might need to take an extended bathroom break during a sporting event um, or setting up in another room when you go to a family gathering. So again, just being mindful of how that sound travels and how it's affecting your child. So now we're going to move on to visual strategies. And on this slide, I have um, a quick example of a child's bedroom. So there's toys, books, electronics, maybe there's food, clothing. Um, just looking at this picture, how does it make you feel? If you're like me, um, this is a pretty stressful or stress-inducing picture. Um, but on our next slide, uh, we have a very tidy room. Um, how does this make you feel? Do you feel calm and serene, organized? And this is definitely not to say that every room needs to look perfect at all times. I think this is probably more of a Pinterest example um, and not necessarily a realistic expectation. Um, but it's just a reminder that in the same way that a loud echoey environment um, might be distressing for our child, having that visual noise or visual clutter can also be very dysregulating. So if we minimize clutter and having a system for organizing things like toys, books, and clothing, it can help our kids to feel more calm and organized, and it also teaches them sort of those organization life skills going forward. Um, so on our next slide, we summarize these visual strategies. We wanna reduce clutter and minimize distractions on the walls. We wanna provide ways to organize toys and materials, so maybe using bins, boxes with visual labels. Um, we can use visuals or pictures to help communicate. So visual schedules, uh, using pictures for our routines. And if we're in a classroom or another learning situation, so maybe homeschool or doing homework or therapy or tutoring, music lessons, um, we want to think about where our child is sitting, uh, both so that they can see well and that they're minimizing those distractions from things like windows, doors, um, or a hallway. If we're practicing drawing or printing, we can use a, visual, a vertical surface, so that's sort of as pictured in this slide here, um, such as an easel or a slant board, so that we keep the work in a visual plane, so the work is right in front of their face where they don't have to keep looking down and looking up again. Um, so this leads into one of our other body senses, which is proprioception. So proprioception is input from our muscles and joints that we receive through deep pressure input. 
such as pulling, pushing, lifting, and squeezing. So if we think of those, those actions of pulling, pushing, lifting, we're thinking about how um, our muscles and joints are feeling. Um, we wanna think about how we're incorporating this sensory input into our daily activities. So some examples that might have been re recommended by your child's OT to use in the classroom might include things like um, using your chair to do push-ups or using a wall to do push-offs. Um, you can have a ball that you're squeezing against um, or even just using your hands squeezing together. Lying on your tummy, so on your front in a prone position, um, is another way to incorporate that deep pressure uh, while you're doing some, uh, maybe some written work. Activities that include heavy work um, include things like carrying heavy books or pushing a heavy cart. So that's kind of what we have pictured here. Um, so this is a great excuse to have your child help out with things like yard work um, or for an older child or youth to do physical exercise such as weight training. Um, another great way of providing that proprioceptive input uh, for older children. And I know we had some questions at our last webinar about that deep pressure or that um, seeking that input. So parents were asking about sort of how we share that information with um, maybe another set of parents or how we uh, share that information with our school. So these are all great activities that are helping to provide that deep pressure input. Um, and then just sharing that information about how that is useful and important um, for your child to stay regulated. Um, on our next slide, we have some tools pictured uh, that also are helping with that proprioceptive or deep pressure input. Um, so sensory tools such as a weighted animal, um, wearing compression clothing, uh, pictured here, this little guy with a stretchy uh, outfit on is called a body sock, um, or even just wearing a weighted backpack. Um, so again, these things are referenced um, that are available uh, through online shopping, or uh, you can consult your child's school or occupational therapist for more information about where to find these tools. Um, now we're gonna move on to movement or vestibular strategies. And just another reminder that as we're going through, please feel free to add your questions in the Q&A um, feature at the bottom of your screen um, so that we can answer as many as possible during our Q&A time. So in terms of vestibular or movement strategies, we remember that our vestibular sense is that sense of balance um, or our relationship to gravity. So it's our awareness of our, our position in space, our head position. So thinking about our day-to-day -day activities, how often does your child get to experience these different movements? Spinning, swinging, climbing, sliding, how often does their head go upside down um, or bouncing? So I'm sure you can think of examples at a park or playground or maybe in a gym or gymnastics environment where you can incorporate many of these different types of movement. But what about those days when you can't get outside or if you can't get to the playground or a park um, in a safe and accessible way? What are some other ways that we can factor these activities into our day to day? So on our next slide, um, we're showing lots of options that we can try at home that require minimal to no equipment. So if we're looking at no equipment, um, we can have our child follow us um, using games and a playful approach such as follow the leader. So maybe we're going over or under, maybe we're going upside down or rolling or jumping or spinning. Um, if your child's able to follow, say, a game of Simon Says, you can try those actions uh, similarly in that playful way. Um, there's lots of yoga and gymnastics types programs that are available um, to try at home. So I know there's YouTube videos such as Cosmic Kids or Go Noodle um, that drew a lot of these approaches that incorporate movement and vestibular input. Sorry. Um, if we have minimal equipment, so if you have a therapy ball at home um, or if you can purchase a small collapsible tunnel or a play tent, um, or even using a mini trampoline at home. These are all great ways to get that spinning, swinging, jumping, bouncing, um, going upside down input uh, even at home. So again, keeping in mind ways to challenge that balance and experiment with head position is our ultimate goal um, with vestibular or movement strategies. So on our next slide, we're talking about movement strategies as it relates to seating options. So if seated work is required, so for example, at school or during homework time, um, but our child needs to move, how can we accommodate those needs? 
Um, your occupational therapist or your child's school team might have some suggestions for seating options that allow for those changes in position um, and that movement input, such as bouncing or shifting positions or swinging their legs. So a few that we have um, pictured here, we have the Neo Rock stool, which allows the child, again, to be rocking um, on their stool. We have a balance disc that can be placed on the child's chair to allow, again, for that um, shifting, changing uh, of weight and position, similarly with the move and sit cu uh, cushion. And finally, we have pictured a bouncy band, so a spot for um, your child to bounce their legs against while they're seated in a chair. So on the next slide, the last sense we're going to discuss is the sense of interoception. So we'll recall that this is how we experience sensations inside our body. So our heart rate, our breathing, our sensing our body temperature, whether we feel full or hungry, um, whether we need to use the washroom. Um, so interoception also helps us to understand the connection between our emotions or feelings and our body sensations. So how, for example, our heart rate speeds up when we're feeling scared or when we're feeling upset. So there's some great books that are available to help explain these concepts for kids. Um, pictured here is Listening to My Body by Gabby Garcia. Um, and we can also use mindfulness and breathing exercises to really focus on tuning in to our body sensations. Uh, activities that help us to explore our emotions are also a great way to connect emotions and feelings in our bodies. You can talk to your child's teacher or therapy team for resources related to this. Um, and there's also resources available both with Autism Ontario and on the Aid Canada website. Um, so the last strategy we're going to talk about today is what I like to call a cozy corner. So you may have heard of this strategy or used a similar approach before where ideally it's a separate space um, that's still visible to the caregiver but offers some degree of privacy or separation from the busyness of the household or from the classroom. So ideally it's only accessible by one child at a time so we don't have all siblings or all classmates piling in at once. Um, and it offers comfortable seating options, maybe blankets, pillows or stuffies. Um, or you could add favorite books, fidget toys, or some visuals. Um, the takeaway here is that it's not intended to be a punishment or a timeout. Um, I like to think of it more as a coffee break for the child. So it's an opportunity to get away from that overwhelming sensory input. Um, so maybe there's noise or busyness at the household. Um, maybe there's siblings or pets or visitors. Um, and your child just needs a bit of a chill out time and space. So we want to make sure that there's adult support available as needed, um, especially if your child does well with having you around to comfort or co-regulate them. Um, and your child can even help with setting up and creating this space. They might have some of their own ideas about how they'd like it set up. Um, I know my daughter liked to create a space like this in her closet um, so she could hide out with her stuffed animals and she'd listen to an audio book uninterrupted. Um, that was particularly uh, important when we were uh, during the pandemic when we were locked down and everybody was in the house at the same time, making sure that your child has a space um, that's comfortable that they can go to to get away. Um, maybe older children, youth or teens might want to create a corner of their bedroom or of your shared living space that's their safe space where they can go when they need alone time or when they need a sensory break. So that brings us to uh, the end of our presentation where we're going to go on a bit of an adventure. Hi everyone and welcome back. This is the live portion of our presentation. I hope you were able to find some information that was useful um, in today's session. And we do have an opportunity now. I, I see that there are lots of questions in our Q&A section, um, but before we get to that, um, we're just going to do a quick little run through of our um, sensory scavenger hunt. Um, I'm aware of time. I know we're almost at 12.30. Um, so the plan is we'll take a quick look at our sensory scavenger hunt um, and then for those who are able to stay on for a few extra minutes, uh, I'll have a chance to get to some of those questions. Um, so just bear with me for a moment. I'm going to bring up the sensory scavenger hunt um, and that is located in the resource section in the bottom right hand corner um, of your screen. So you can feel free to pull that up and follow along and there is also a French version if you're interested. So hopefully you're able to see that now. 
Um, the idea of this sensory scavenger hunt is you can either have a printed copy or maybe you can have a copy on your cell phone or a device that you bring with you. Uh, the next time you go maybe out for a family walk or you're going to a park or a playground and you can sort of experiment with some of these, um, these sensory activities. So the first is around sight or our visual sense and we can create a bit of a spot it or an eye spy game. Um, so looking for things like local plants, animals or objects you can pay, pay attention to the colors or the shapes that you're seeing. Um, so some ideas we have on this page, things like looking for a dandelion or a squirrel or a leaf or a bird. The next one is around sound, so our auditory sense. And that gives you a chance to just close your eyes and listen. So thinking about sounds that you might recognize, birds chirping the wind, water, cars passing by, maybe some traffic. Um, animals, squirrels chattering, or dogs barking. And you and your child can try and imitate some of those sounds with your voice. So chirping like a bird or blowing like the wind. Um, touch or our tactile sense. This is a great opportunity if you can safely collect items in the forest or at the beach or at a park or even in your neighborhood. So maybe finding something that's rough or something that's soft, something that's hard, something that's bumpy. So we have some examples pictured on this page as well. Uh, moving on to our next page, so we do have some activities for smell and taste. And now that we're getting into um, season for local fruit and vegetables, you can maybe have a few that you'd like your child to try or that they'd like to try. Um, so maybe take a guess before you taste it how you think it might taste. Maybe you can smell it or touch with your fingers or touch to your lips or your tongue or your teeth. And then see if anything surprises you about how something might taste. Uh, and finally, we have movement and body position. So those are those vestibular and proprioceptive senses. And this is where we can safely experiment with movement. Um, again, maybe at a park or a playground. So things like moving quickly, moving super slow in slow motion like a slog, um, finding ways to be upside down, spinning, rolling or twirling, and bouncing or jumping. So like I mentioned, um, that resource is available just in the bottom right hand corner. Uh, under the resource section. So I'm going to take a few minutes to go through uh, the questions that are listed here, if you will bear with me. Um, for those that aren't able to stay on, thanks again for joining. Um, this session is being recorded, so it will be available to watch back at a later date. Um, so if you did want to tune in again, uh, if you want to see the answer to the questions, you can feel free uh, to try that. So we have a question around, um, my seven-year-old has a mixed tactile response. She loves to hug and stay close to just about anyone, but on the other hand, she can't tolerate tags on clothing, et cetera. How can I help her? Um, so this is a great question because we're talking about that tactile sense and sort of talking about the difference between light touch and deep pressure. So oftentimes light touch, like that um, gentle sort of tickling sensation, um, can be really dist distressing or dysregulating for some children. Whereas deep pressure, where you're getting um, you know, like a deep massage or a deep squeeze, or in this example, we're talking about a deep hug, can be really regulating. So we're getting that, that input right into our muscles and joints, uh, and that can often be very calming and regulating. So those are all the strategies we talked about with deep pressure, um, things like using a weighted blanket or a weighted animal, um, any of those heavy work activities that we talked about are all getting into that sense of proprioception and deep pressure, which is a very common sense. So thanks for asking that question. Um, the next question is around fidget toys. Um, so it's asking about what age a child can understand that a fidget tool is to be used, a toy is to be used as a tool, and some age-appropriate fidgets for a three-year-old. Um, so that's definitely a good point, is that we're in that toddler and preschooler age. We're not necessarily expecting that cognitively they would understand um, the difference between when it should be used as a toy or a tool. Um, and that was meant to be more uh, around sort of maybe the school environment. So for older children who are using a fidget toy to stay regulated, um, for example, when they're listening to a lesson or perhaps while they're um, doing some written work or working on a project, um, we want to make sure that their fidget tool is a tool and it's not distracting. Um, whereas for that younger age group, really we can use anything that's going to keep our child's hands busy when they're looking for that really touchy-feely input. So an example that I would use um, if your child is in, say, a preschool environment, 
um, daycare, uh, even early kindergarten, junior kindergarten, and they're one of those kids that really likes to touch and feel and have their hands maybe all over their peers. An example might be when they're lining up, so if they're expected to um, line up to move from one space to another one, maybe they can hold on to a stuffed animal, or maybe they can have a special job of carrying the book for the teacher. So something that's keeping their hands occupied, and as we said, in an age-appropriate way, um, that, uh, again, it doesn't necessarily need to have that understanding of toy versus tool. That's more our job as the adult is giving a child something to keep their hands busy. Um, next, we have a question about auditory and sound. Um, it says, my son finds certain noises aversive, so unexpected, unpredictable noises like automatic flushes, hand dryers in public washrooms, children fussing or crying. Uh, most of the time, noise canceling headphones or earplugs may work. However, there are times when my son will refuse to put them on or move to another location when the noise, where the noise can no longer be heard. He will demand for the noise to stop, which isn't always possible. Are there any other strategies we could possibly use? Um, so I like that this question, you're tapping into that idea um, as far as sensory processing goes, that kind of our two strategies are giving uh, our child an opportunity to sort of avoid or desensitize. So either giving those noise canceling headphones um, that are going to sort of dampen the noise or giving them the opportunity to get away from the noise if it's something that's distressing and if they do fall into that sensory sensitive um, small cup uh, kind of category. Um, but also acknowledging that there aren't always there aren't always <laughs> um, the opportunity to get away from or to use maybe some of those strategies aren't working um, like our noise canceling headphones. Um, that might be when we're looking at more of a behavioral approach. So maybe doing more of a first then, if it's an activity that absolutely has to be done, um, even when they're, you know, if you need to go to the washroom, even when there's going to be a really loud sound, um, then maybe that's something where we have a preferred activity after the fact. Maybe we're using visuals to communicate um, what's going to happen first and what's going to happen next. And I will defer to my wonderful colleagues um, in behavior uh, who can provide some extra support with that. Um, we also have a question around motor planning and how it relates to sensory processing. Um, and this was just meant to be sort of a uh, beginner level, I guess, sensory processing discussion today uh, in these three series. But there's lots of great information, as I mentioned, in the resource tab. Um, also, if you're looking at Gene Ayers uh, was the original, if you were uh, the original presentation, uh, the first one that we had. Um, the sensory integration theory that was developed back in the 1970s. So there is specific training related to sensory integration. If you are um, a professional or occupational therapist um, or teacher or parent who's interested in learning more, um, please feel free, as I said, checking in our resources as well um, as seeking out some of those more specific resources related to sensory integration theory. Um, I'm just going to look to see if I've missed anything. Um, so my, there's a question about my seven-year-old has developed a fear of birds. Who can help or what strategies can we use to help her? Um, so that's a great question because I think uh, I like the fact that you are using a sensory lens to look at this fear. So maybe there are things um, like we talked about earlier, if there's a sound that's unexpected or that's uh, there's been an experience that's been frightening when there's been um, a really loud sound perhaps that's uh, triggered your child or even looking at other sensory input. So maybe the birds are flying really close. Maybe she's um, seen a situation or maybe in a book or on a television show where there's been a, um, a situation that's been a little bit frightening. So you might want to tap into that a little bit more and find out more information about maybe what exactly uh, that fear is related to. And again, that might be something you want to tap into um, your behavior team as it relates to that, that response. Um, so I think we've covered all the questions. I know we're a little bit over time. Um, I appreciate those that were able to stick around. And as I mentioned, you're still able to uh, see the first presentation and the second presentation um, just by clicking on those links in the resource tab. Thanks again for joining us. I hope that you had some useful information and I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.